Hello, everyone. Thank you for standing by, and welcome to All About Teeth and Teething, sponsored by ISIS Parenting and presented by Dr. Sonia Wu. My name is Nancy Holtzman. I'm the Vice President of Clinical Content here at ISIS Parenting, and I'm a nurse, lactation consultant, and infant developmental specialist, and I'll be serving as moderator today. During today's presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. However, you may submit questions by typing them through the chat feature located to the left of your screen. We'll have time to answer questions at the end of today's presentation. This webinar is being recorded, and all of you will receive a link to the recording by email tomorrow. So if you miss something or need to step away for any reason, that's okay. ISIS Parenting is proud to host today's webinar. ISIS is the nation's most trusted prenatal and early parenting destination. We provide innovative programs and a highly edited selection of products for expecting and new families in our four Boston area centers and online at isisparenting.com. As I mentioned, I'm Nancy Holtzman, and I'll be your moderator today, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to our expert speaker, Dr. Sonia Wu. Dr. Wu is a pediatric dentist with practice at Pediatric Dental Associates in Winchester and Reading, Massachusetts. She's a graduate of Cornell University and received her dental degree from the University of Pennsylvania School of Dental Medicine. She completed a two-year residency program in pediatric dentistry at the Lutheran Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York, and served as a clinical instructor in pediatric dentistry at New York University. Dr. Wu is a member of the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, American Dental Association, a diplomat of the American Board of Pediatric Dentistry, and most importantly, she is the mother of a four-year-old daughter and a two-year-old son. Dr. Wu is also an ISIS mom, and she and her children have attended many, many classes here at ISIS Parenting. It's my pleasure to welcome you today, Dr. Wu. Thank you, Nancy. This has been a, it's been a great journey with ISIS Parenting, and I really have enjoyed a lot of the courses and information and, of course, the friendships that I've made through ISIS. So this is going to be really fun today because we're going to be talking about um, baby teeth and teething. Uh, it's really exciting because it's definitely part of your baby's milestone. So uh, basically we're here to talk about uh, a few um, things about teeth and we're talking about what you're going to be expecting, how to take care of your baby's teeth and um, go on from there. So a few of the questions that we get a lot of the, at the office is that we, people ask us, why are we brushing and flossing baby teeth when they just fall out anyway? And kids don't really get cavities, right? So why are we even bothering? And the last is, a lot of people will tell us, you know, my child really does not like to brush his or her teeth, so I'm just going to wait until he gets a little older, and is that going to be a problem? Well, the problem with that is, as we can see in this next slide, that there's actually been a rise in cavities across the nation, and uh, pediatric dentists across the nation have noticed that more preschoolers are coming in with 6 to 10 plus cavities. And this is across all socioeconomic levels. Um, it's not just targeting the high economic levels, high socioeconomic levels, or the lower socioeconomic levels. It's all across the board. And with this increase of preschoolers coming in at a younger age, then there's also been an increase in treatment in the OR or operating room under general anesthesia. And why is this happening? Well, we're starting to see that a lot of parenting has changed and there's more of this endless snacking and juice. Uh, people are favoring bottled water, which is something a little bit more convenient, versus tap water, which is typically more fluoridated or typically fluoridated. Um, and also foregoing the age one dental visit just because of lack of knowledge or they just don't think their child is going to be able to sit for the appointment. So this is all comes from um, the New York Times article, Rise in Preschool Cavities Prompts Anesthesia Use from March 6, 2012. So in the old days or old school, everyone thought everyone's going to get a cavity, so let's just not worry about it until it happens and we'll just drill and fill it. And after that, we'll talk to the patient about uh, prevention, um, oral hygiene, um, diet, things like that. And let's not worry about a child coming in until about age three because that child's not going to be able to sit at all. So the difference, though, today we've noticed that caries is a common chronic infectious transmissible disease caused primarily by mutans streptococci 
or strep mutans. And um, this is entirely preventable. And that's why we really want people to come in for their early dental visits so we can prevent disease. Uh, during this visit, we'll talk about risk assessment, anticipatory guidance, things like that. Um, also, part of what is important today is we see that perinatal oral health visits help prevent transmission and affect the child of the, the health of the child as well. <clears throat> so, streptococci uh, mutans is basically it can colonize from the time of birth, and it typically adheres to tooth structures. However, uh, when baby doesn't have any teeth, it can also harbor bacteria, or t the tongue can harbor bacteria if there are no teeth um, present as well. And the thing about strep mutans is it metabolizes sugars to produce acid, and therefore it demineralizes tooth structure. So what's really important, though, is that we really create good, a good foundation and start with building blocks. And that starts at perinatal care because we've seen that links between periodontal disease and preterm deliveries and low birth weights and preeclampsia can occur. And also what we've noticed is that when there's an increased amount of strep mutans in mom, she has a greater risk of infecting children with bacteria at an early age. So as we said, perinatal care is important and uh, nutrition is important during that time. Uh, especially with prenatal vitamins, calcium, phosphorus, vitamin A, C, and D are all um, key elements in helping healthy teeth form in baby. Also during your pregnancy, what's important is to continue dental care. And I'm not talking about elective dental care. I'm talking about uh, active cavities that you may have or active caries. And x-rays are part of this uh, treatment, local anesthesia. Uh, both of these are actually okay, but you probably want to stay uh, towards your, opto your second trimester because it's most optimum. You're most comfortable at that time. Uh, during third trimester, you're a little bit less comfortable and it's harder for you to sit for a longer amount of time. So we talked about caries control and we talked about strep mutans. And the way that strep mutans can be transmitted is either vertically or horizontally. Um, and also during uh, prenatal uh, care, periodontal health is also very important. Pregnancy gingivitis is a very common um, thing that a lot of pregnant women experience. Uh, your gums are a bit inflamed and that's what happens and they're very hypersensitive from the hormones. So any type of a little piece of plaque or any type of uh, food that may be there, your gums may react a little bit more. Just keep up with the flossing and brushing. You may initially see some, some bleeding and things like that, but that's okay. As long as you keep flossing and brushing, it should start to get better. Obviously, if there's any issues, you want to contact your um, dental um, provider. So also periodontal disease and preterm birth, uh, as we mentioned before, there's a possible positive relationship with that. And starting a good foundation for your baby is another way, and that's with the early dental visit. So. <clears throat> As we talked about caries control and cavity prevention and also transmitting to child, we want to start reducing the reservoir. And that's with mom um, with caries control. And that's dental treatment of active caries. As again, I said, not elective treatment, but more something that you need to do. Uh, suppress maternal reservoir. Another way that the people have seen is through xylitol chewing gum, uh, chlorhexidine rinses, which is an antimicrobial rinse, which is prescription only. Typically, it's only used for um, gum issues or periodontal disease, not so much for uh, cavities and things like that, and also fluoride. But the reason I had mentioned chlorhexidine um, is because they had done a study uh, a while back where they noticed that they gave one group of mothers who had active caries, uh, chlorhexidine rinses, and another group who did not get the chlorhexidine, chlorhexidine rinses. And they noticed in the 23-month-olds that came from mothers that did do the chlorhexidine rinses, only 11% of them had the strep mutans versus the 45% of the 23-month-olds that did not um, come from the mothers that did the chlorhexidine rinses. So also what we noticed was xylitol gum, uh, if, it if it's chewed two to three times daily, has a significant impact on mother-child transmission of strep mutans, which therefore decreases the child's rate of strep mutans in their mouth. Um, a new article has just come out, or a new study came out, citing that xylitol, they're not sure if it really actually um, is the chewing gum, the active sugarless uh, chewing gum, or if it's the ingredient that has been 
decreasing the amount of people having cavities over a significant period of time, but uh, we definitely know that strep mutans is definitely decreased by the Zolotol. <coughs> so we talked about carrier control, and we talked about vertical transmission. And vertical transmission is transmission of strep mutans from caregiver to child. As you can see in this picture here, Alicia Silverstone came under quite some controversy, I think a couple years ago, because she was chewing her food for her baby and then transferring it and giving to the baby um, after she had chewed it to help um, the child eat. So basically that's one way you want to try to really avoid the vertical transmission is avoid chewing for baby. But the other two, uh, which is a bit more common, is uh, avoid sharing utensils, uh, cleaning baby's pacifier with your own mouth, which uh, we just came under fire with that commercial that they had recently with the, with the um, fathers who were rocking their children to sleep in the Loves or Huggies uh, commercial and they were holding their pass the baby's pacifier in the mouth. That's something you probably don't want to do because you're transferring strep mutan bacteria and other bacteria to your child. So here we have uh, horizontal transmission. Uh, basically what, how it's done is it occurs within your own family, meaning sibling to sibling, not caregiver to child. And then um, also outside your family, such as daycare and play dates. And during the play dates, it's uh, something that sometimes can be a little difficult, but if you turn around, you turn your back, sometimes the kids are kind of sharing each other's sippy cups and things like that. So we want to try to avoid that if possible uh, during play dates as well. <coughs> and then we come to our first year dental visit. And as you can see, this is a picture of um, a baby who happens to be my child who is no longer this age. But uh, a lot of parents, when it hits their first year, uh, they have a nice little birthday party and it's nice to reflect back. One thing you want to think about is also the question of have you scheduled your first year uh, dental visit yet? And if you haven't, this is a good time to start doing that. So the early dental visit. Now why is it important? And that's what we'll talk about. But when is it done? Usually by age one. Uh, and why do we want you to do it is to come in so we can examine early to prevent disease. As we talked about earlier, uh, caries is something that's truly preventable and it's a disease. Uh, we talked about risk assessment and we look at caries risk assessment, meaning you know how likely is your child to have cavities if there's any problems going on, meaning any new cavities starting or any uh, demineral occurring. Uh, we also, then you'll have a plan for dental trauma, meaning you'll have someone you can call. And dental trauma is pretty common um, because most, most uh, infants are learning to crawl or they're learning to walk. And one of the uh, most common traumas is basically the laceration of the frenum, which is basically that muscle attached from the lip, the upper lip to the, to the ridge of your um, mouth there, the gum tissue. And a lot of times kids will fall and they'll, they'll cut that. And initially, most first-time parents are very distraught because they think there's a lot of blood coming out. But what happens is the blood and the saliva are being mixed, so it looks like a lot of um, blood, and it's not that much as you think it is. Um, it is scary initially, but typically there is no treatment for this, and we just kind of watch it. In fact, uh, later on in life, when some of your children are going through orthodontics, you'll notice or you'll have an appointment to have that actually de detached or, um, or uh, cut off. So what happens next is also uh, a second dental trauma that's very common is basically when your child is crawling or walking or running, they may run into the wall or into another child and they'll bump their tooth. And that is very, very common. I'd say we see that almost at least two to three times a week at our office. And it's something that we tell people is mostly palliative treatment that we, um, that we do to take care of it. We just take a look at it. We may take an x-ray. Uh, if, we if we're not able to take an x-ray, we just watch it and we, we monitor it. And it may be a little wiggly. And what happens is over time, it may harden and it may discolor. If it discolors, that's fine. What we're worried about is any type of infection, which would be an abscess or a bubble or a pimple above that tooth. Uh, the next reason we have the early dental visit is diet, which we'll go on and we'll talk about later. And of course, comprehensive dental care and how to care for your child's teeth and, um, and so forth. So people ask us, you know, what's, what do we expect when we come see the dentist for the first time? Because there's no way my child is going to sit down and sit in the chair. And we as pediatric dentists or any other dentist are not going to be expecting that your child is going to sit and lie back so 
peacefully and happily as my son here, who's who's hamming it up for the the, the camera. But um, basically, what happens is we have um, a lab to lab examination. Uh, sometimes, in some cases, we're able to do a toothbrush demonstration. If your child is super good or really, really good, which is, as I said, unlikely, we'll try to do a cleaning. Or if there's some staining or something that we need to take off, we'll try to do it there then for you. And we will apply a fluoride varnish if we find that after we do a caries risk assessment or um, we notice any dem demineralization or cavity starting, we'll put some on. And it takes very little time. It's nothing like when we were kids where we had a gel or a foam that would just sit there on our mouth. It's actually a, a little swipe that we do with a little brush, and it takes less than two seconds. Um, and as we said, we would talk about an interval for reevaluation if necessary. And most cases we'll say, you know, we'll see you back in a year or six months. But um, in other cases, uh, some people will nef definitely need to come in a little bit, um, come in at an earlier interval than that. And of course, we'll talk about anticipatory guidance, which is basically uh, what to expect in the upcoming years. Um, and this is the next slide, which is great example of what a lap to lap exam looks like in the clinic. And the great thing about a lap to lap exam is that the child is still very close to their caregiver, whether it be mom, dad, or grandma, grandpa, whoever is bringing them in, or auntie, or uncle. So basically, the good thing is you have the closeness of the parent or the caregiver, and also the, the clinician can really just go over what they're looking at and what to, um, or how to brush better, or things that a little bit out of the ordinary or also very ordinary. And they, the parent has a really good view. Not only that, but the child has a good view of the caregiver. So they have some type of semblance of some comfort. Um, and as you can see, you know, siblings a lot of times come with their um, siblings for dental visits. And as you can see, this one's checking out the situation, not sure what's happening. So we'll go on to the next slide, which is anticipatory guidance. And it's information on what to expect. Uh, we'll go over dental and oral development uh, fluoride status, meaning if you're living in an area with uh, fluoridated water. A lot of people don't realize this. They're if they're giving their child only uh, bottled water, but they're cooking with this, um, the tap water, they're actually incorporating fluoride into the food that they're cooking for their child. So they are receiving some fluoride. So you don't have to worry so much about that. Um, there are um, things that we go over, such as non-nutritive sucking habits which is pacifiers and thumbs. Uh, we talked about teething, injury prevention, which we went over a little bit, um, oral hygiene instructions, and diet. <clears throat> and then we talk, in this slide, we'll talk about primary tooth development. And I think after you've had your child, and it's been about a year, you forget that when baby teeth or primary teeth actually develop. And they actually start developing in the second trimester uh, in utero. But as we talk about baby teeth, usually most kids are going to get 20 baby teeth. And their first tooth usually erupts approximately 6 to 10 months of age. And as we always tell people, this is a huge variance because sometimes people come in and their child is actually ha has a tooth erupting at 4 and a half months versus the 6 months. And then some people, their child has come in and they haven't even started really having any teeth cut in until about 12 months. So really, this is a timetable, and it's not anything to worry about if you're a little different or your child is, your child is a little bit different. Uh, the last two that erupts typically is your second primary molar. It's usually the one on the top, and it happens around 31 to 33 months of age. But as I said, we do have a lot of patients that come in, and they've already hit their three-year-old mark. Um, and they still haven't really started to have this tooth come in, or it's just barely coming in. So all of this, as I said, is totally normal, and it's just nice to have a little bit of a timetable so you have a semblance of what things are gonna, when things are going to happen. So we're talking about teething versus cutting a teeth. And signs of teething basically are drooling, biting, gum rubbing, irritability, disruption in eating and sleeping. And this, of course, happens not just with the child, but the whole family gets a disruption. And everyone gets a little cranky. We get a little diarrhea can occur, and a low fever can happen as well, such as um, pretty much in the 100 degree range, because anything uh, greater than that is probably something else. 
So, and Nancy can talk about that now. Yeah, I think that um, I do spend a lot of time talking about teething as a behavior versus teething as a sign of cutting a tooth because starting around three to four months, you will see babies with their hands in their mouths. As soon as they can get their hand in their mouth by 10 weeks, they will. It's no longer a feeding cue, and uh, it's not a sign of an erupting or emerging tooth. So you will see at three and four months the baby's hands in the mouth, increase in saliva production, anything they are able to hold or stick in the mouth, they will. And very typically at four and five months, we do see some new onset sleep disruption at night, which is more to do with sleep associations and less to do with an erupting tooth. So I tackle many questions at three and four months about teething and sleep disruption, uh, and generally it's still going to be another three months before the baby cuts their first tooth. This is a behavior. This is not the sign of uh, emerging teeth. All right. So next part is teething, and how can you help? And a lot of parents will come in and say, you know, what can I do for my child? And typically there's not much you can do except for palliative treatment. Uh, but one of the things that we really, we don't recommend using is the, the teething gels or the aura gel. Uh, just because, one, the analgesic effect is pretty short-lived, and two, the FDA also has, has told us and to, has told also parents that, you know, this is not a good um, vehicle for, for pain medication just because of the, the increased chance of toxicity in your um, infant as well. And also, if your infant has any type of blood disorder or anything like that, it can ex exacerbate the situation. So what we typically do recommend is Tylenol or Motrin or Advil, which is usually six months after, or at a six month, when they're six months old. Um, you don't want to use it night after night. Uh, it's not something that probably is a good idea. So if you can, just you know, monitor and see how long the teething or, or discomfort can go for. Uh, trying gum massage is a good idea, cold teething rings, and, um, and Nancy again has a few words on teethers for you. Yeah, I think um, this is a, one of my, um, one of our uh, ISIS parents has sent in this picture of her little boy enjoying a winkle, which is one of my favorite teething toys. And it's really tricky to find the perfect teething toys for very young babies who are very oral. They want to put things in their mouth. They want to get a satisfying chew, but so many toys and rattles are either too big for them to hold and manipulate uh, or don't fit comfortably in the baby's mouth so the baby actually gets frustrated or they're so heavy that when the baby overshoots their aim as they usually do, they'll clock themselves in the forehead with something a little bit heavy. So um, you want to look for something uh, like a pair of links or a soft and pliable teether that will fit comfortably in the baby's hand and that they really can um, handle and grasp and orally explore. But you will see starting at three months, the hands are in the mouth constantly. At four months, objects are in the mouth. And at five months, they're grabbing their foot and trying to get that in the mouth, too. Um, I'll give you some links tomorrow in the email that we send out that specifically show a variety of teethers that are very appropriate uh, between three and 12 months. All right, thank you, Nancy. So uh, the other issue is a lot of people will, will be a little confused as when teething is happening. And when you rule out teething is basically when there's a high fever greater than 101 degrees. If you see that, you know it's probably going to be an infection. You may want to just call your pediatrician if it's over a few days or so. Um, if irritability lasts more than a few days and sleep disruption is lasting more than five nights. Uh, typically, that is an issue as well. So, um, just uh, something to think about. All right. The so next is brushing. And when should you brush? That's a lot, that's a really good question by most of the patients that come on in um, for their early dental visit. And you really want to start when the first tooth erupts. And it seems to be that the toothbrush seems to work best, but you can definitely use a gauze or a towel to remove plaque and food debris. And in fact, they do have like a little um, hand puppet almost that's made out of terry cloth. It's like a little bunny, and it's super cute, and the kids probably love it. So that's a good way to start. And also, uh, you can start doing that even before their teeth come in just to get kind of a semblance of a routine going and also just for the baby to get used to having your fingers in their mouth and getting used to having, uh, having their teeth brushed uh, twice a day. And encourage play and imitation to develop good habits. So that's, that's what you want to do is to start a good foundation. So a lot of people will ask us about better brushing or how to brush better. 
And I always tell people the best way is if you have better visualization or better access and also better stabilization, you will get better brushing. And one of the good ways to do that is to have them lay back or supine positioning to brush and floss because you can see so much better. You can see inside. Uh, you can stabilize them. What you don't want to do is probably do this on the bathroom counter. It's really, if, if you're kind of turning your back for a second, they could just really roll off. Uh, if you're struggling with them, it's not going to give you much stability. Uh, but what's important is parents should be brushing their infants a minimum of once a day. Uh, bedtime is best for this. Uh, of course, you know, if you can do it in the morning, that's the best. But as you can see in this picture, though, what's really important is the access and visualization so you can see where you're brushing. I find that parents tend to, and uh, you know, we've all been guilty of this, is just brushing where you can't see because you're trying to just hurry up, get them into bed, uh, get the routine going. But it's better if you can just retract the cheek, get in there, and you can see better. And you can actually use your finger later on just to check and make sure there's no um, buildup on there. Um, it sounds a bit crude, but it is a way to just make sure everything is, is taken off. Um, and that's one way to do it. And you don't have to worry that you're retracting too much, because if you can see a toddler who's making faces and kind of spreading their, their lips and mouth open like that, you know they're fine. The other is a lot of parents will ask us about how much pressure to use when brushing. Well, if you're basically brushing your teeth every day, you can just use the same pressure and it's fine. So brushing habits, as we said, start early. Uh, remember uh, that they do, and you want to start a good foundation as we talked about earlier. You want to encourage independence, but before that, modeling is really important. Monkey see, monkey do. Um, a lot of people will also talk about brushing together as a family. That really helps promote oral health care and also to set a good example. Uh, before your child is even really brushing, as an infant you can actually brush and floss in front of them just so that they have an idea of what uh, their routine will be like when they grow older. And also, if you ever notice that a baby typically will always want to do what their parent is doing. So it really does help. And as, as it is, it's monkey see, monkey do. So parental help until dexterity allows for independence. Now this is when your child gets older. And in our office, we typically tell people that once a child can start to you know, learn script or anything like that, their, their dexterity is probably getting there. And you can really make sure that they're brushing by using a timer for about two to three minutes. And then afterwards, you know, again, encouraging independence, just check their teeth after. You don't have to brush for them at this point anymore, but just check their teeth after. And maybe if you need to and you notice that there's any buildup, and definitely lift up the lip again, as I said, even at this age, so you can see what's going on, because sometimes they don't brush the front teeth as well as they do the back or vice versa, and just to make sure they're doing a great job. <clears throat> so as we move along to toothpaste, as you can see, whenever you go to the drugstore or to Target or wherever you're going, there are so many types of toothpaste, especially adult toothpaste. And if you decide to use adult toothpaste instead of children's toothpaste that's fluoridated for your child, that's fine because a lot of them actually have about the same amount of fluoride as the child's toothpaste except for the ones that are toddler training or different brands that are a little um, a little bit more boutique-y. But anyway, so adult versus children's toothpaste, you can use either. But if you're going to use the adult toothpaste, make sure you use the plainest kind. Don't get the kind with the tartar control or the whitening or the fresh whitening strips or anything like that. You just try to get in there with regular plain toothpaste from Krebs, Colgate, AIM, whoever um, the ADA tends to, uh, to certify or has um, the little brand on the back. So. Children's toothpaste, the great thing about it is the taste. So that's why kids tend to like to brush longer with it and they have better compliance. Uh, the, the reason being also is that they tend to also have a character on them or they make it more a little bit, even the piece is a little bit more sparkly. So that's great. But the only thing is it tends to be more ingested and it's mostly by age group of uh, two to three years old. And so therefore with that you want to know that you want to make sure you're washing them and making sure that they're not really swallowing too much. So toothpaste, we ask about fluoridated or not fluoridated, and when and what to use. Before age two, if a child is at low risk, you can use the training toothpaste. And as you can see, we have a brand here that works really well, no additives, it's very natural. 
Um, or you can use water, whichever is easiest. And, and if you're just going to use water, that means you can pretty much brush anywhere. So if you're about to give, you know, put your child to bed and, and you want to just do a quick swipe before uh, the, or right after the last feeding, you can go ahead and just do it right there. Um, but however, if your child is at moderate to high risk, then they do, do recommend a fluoridated toothpaste and just a smear of that. I tend to say more of a pea-sized smear. And as you can see in this next slide, you can see a great um, picture of it. And the smear appears, to, if the smear is on the left, and that's for zero to two years old, again, if she or he is at risk. I will tell people that the indicator line is really helpful. You don't actually have to do the smear. You can actually just do a quick horizontal swipe, or just even better, if you really worry that your child is going to be ingesting the fluoride or fluoridated toothpaste, you can actually just touch the toothpaste to the toothbrush and not extrude any out, and you'll be getting some toothpaste on there. Um, after age two or two to five year olds, uh, two, for two to five year olds, you can go ahead and use a pea sized fluoridated toothpaste. Again, indicator line on the brush is helpful. Not all of them have that, but if they do, it's really nice and helpful. And you want to monitor closely again because, as we said earlier, that this toothpaste, especially children's toothpaste, is ingested by about 24 to 40 percent of the. So the next one is flossing, and we usually get three heads. They look at us we like we have three heads. The patient's parents really. They ask us like, really, why are we flossing kids' teeth? But really, it is important because you have cavities that can occur in between teeth. Um, and also, of course, a periodontal or gum help. And when do you want to start? Well, well, you want you to start when teeth start touching together or touch each other. And sometimes uh, when toothbrush can't reach in between, that's another good time because a lot of times after brushing, you'll notice that some food is lodged in there or some buildup is lodged in and the toothbrush bristle just cannot get it out. So that's a good time to go ahead and use a flosser or flossing. Um, the flossers that we have here are very handy. Uh, there are different kinds. They all have, some of them have little princess characters on them, which makes flossing a little bit more fun. But um, you can definitely use the flossers, but we find that the floss is probably most effective. But if the only way you can floss is using a flosser every night, then that's totally fine too. So what we talk about is diet, and we talk about overnight use bottle, overnight bottle use for older babies. And you really want to limit bedtime use due to caries because frequent nighttime bottle feeding is associated with increased risk of cavities. So you just have to be really careful. But not only that, it also is a choking and aspiration, um, can be prone to choking and aspiration. Also your child can be more prone to ear infection um, and there's an increased risk because usually what happens is in a child, unlike a, an adult, the eustachian tube is a little bit more horizontal. So if they're lying down and, and having the bottle, what happens is it can go towards back towards the eustachian tube and pool there and then it, it can actually uh, promote breeding of bacteria and then therefore you have an ear infection. So also when we talk about bedtime use, if you're going to give them the bottle at all, which of course as we said you probably shouldn't because of choking and aspiration and the ear infection risk, but water is probably best. Uh, you really don't want to do juice um, even if it's unsweetened just because 100% fruit juice is still a sugar. And then even if you dilute it, it's still a problem. Uh, what happens is it may be better for your body, but what happens is it's the exposure or frequency of exposures for teeth that it, it becomes problematic. We want our teeth to be at a certain pH level, neutral level, most of the time. But every time you take a sip of a juice or eat a snack or anything like that, it goes down below that pH level into a demineralization zone. So every time your child drinks from di a diluted juice or a sip of diluted juice, what happens is it dips down below that pH level. And then every time he stops, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes for, for him to go back up. So if he's drinking every 10 to 15 minutes a sip, he's going to continue to stay in that demineralization zone. So it's best to just have water, and hopefully that will, be, that will keep you at a new, more neutral pH level or even in remineralization mode. In this scenario, I think what you're talking about is putting the baby down in the crib with a bottle of, of milk or formula or uh, even uh, juice or right. that's what you're talking about as opposed to a nighttime feeding that a, a three or six or nine month old baby may still want or need. Exactly. Yes. So that's, that's the difference and, and um, Nancy, that's a good point that you made. So, um, and typically your pediatrician will also want you to wean the bottle by age 12 months. 
to 24 months, but typically it's age 12 months. So we move on to sippy cups and straw cups, and sippy cups are very convenient, but they're very similar to a bottle. In fact, they're almost like a bottle, so just use it with water. If they're playing around outside and they're thirsty, you know, go ahead and give them a sippy juice with water. That's totally fine. Again, as I said, just try to, try to just not give them the juice. It's probably the best thing. That way they won't want it later because they won't know about it. Um, but also straw cups. Um, after 12 to 18 months is probably better for better oral motor and speech development, whereas with a sippy cup, you're still using that tongue thrust, and therefore they may continue to use it, and this way they kind of learn a little bit better on how to control their tongue. So the next is diet, again, and it's breastfeeding. And breastfeeding and breast milk is strongly endorsed by the AAP and the AAPD, which is the American Academy of Pediatricians and the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. Uh, breastfeeding or breast milk is, is a great thing. You have the closeness. It also has the great nutrients. There's no way you can simulate either one of them. Um, but however, it's, a, so it's also a carbohydrate, and it leads to demineralization of teeth, especially when it's combined with other carbohydrates. Uh, and also frequency on demand throughout the night without adequate oral hygiene is a risk for toddlers. Uh, there are also, through ISIS, Many of the classes will cite, and there are articles um, associated with reduced need for orthodontia in childhood through breastfeeding as well. So breastfeeding and biting, uh, nip it in the bud. So <laughs> breastfeeding and teeth are complete, completely compatible. Uh, most common, um, as Nancy will say, yeah, I think is about this, eight to this is months. a quick summary of, uh, of another webinar I have on the breastfeeding resources page that I'll link to tomorrow in your resource guide. But I did a 30-minute webinar on breastfeeding and biting and, and how to both prevent and manage that. But uh, you know, it really is true that your babies can and will get teeth, and they can and will continue to breastfeed. Um, you shouldn't be afraid of teething or teeth when you're breastfeeding. Uh, the most common that babies are nippy at the breast tends to be between 8 and 12 months, and that's because they're getting their first teeth, the bottom teeth, followed by the top teeth. And really, the top teeth are often more problematic. Uh, the bottom teeth are covered by the baby's tongue when he's properly latched. So the bottom teeth really don't interfere very much with breastfeeding. The top teeth, however, can kind of uh, press against the areola even when the baby is properly latched. So those are the ones that nursing moms tend to notice the most. And unfortunately, the top teeth plus the bottom teeth, if the baby does bite down, um, can, can be uncomfortable or painful. What you want to do if your baby does bite down when he or she is nursing is actually practice the smoosh method. So holding the back of the baby's head, and if he does bite down, you want to smoosh the baby's head deeply into the breast tissue, and uh, that covers his nose, and he will not be able to breathe, and within about two seconds, he'll open his mouth to get air, and then you can take him off the nipple and not get hurt. Um, but just like other types of manners that you need to teach your baby proper, proper behavior, uh, they're not allowed to play with electrical outlets, they're not going to bite cords, and they're not allowed to bite other people, and they're not allowed to bite mom when she's nursing either. So there are some uh, preventative measures you can take. Starting around four and five months, I would encourage you not to let your baby chew or gnaw on your fingers or your chin or your nose or any part of your body before they have teeth. Often you let them chew on, on your fingers, and then after they have top and bottom teeth, you're not going to let them. But they don't know the difference between the day they have teeth and the day they don't, uh, and they don't understand why it's okay for them to bite your finger but not bite your nipple. So starting around four or five months, get your fingers out of your baby's mouth in terms of uh, being a, te a teether for them and offer them uh, teething toys that are appropriate. Don't, they are welcome to bite and chew their own fingers and their own feet, but uh, not your fingers, not your chin, not your nose, and certainly not your nipple. Um, I will include a link uh, for more information on uh, how to manage uh, these situations because if a baby does bite down when they're nursing and mom reacts very strongly, Sometimes that can even uh, precipitate a nursing strike, and that's very devastating, too. So you really want to be aware of uh, what happens when a baby is in a nippy phase and the feeding uh, before the baby does, because it's usually at the tail end of feeding when the baby's playing around that the bites happen, um, and know what to expect and how to address a biting scenario. Thanks, Nancy. So. <clears throat> 
we talk about diet, and what's really important is the rule of five. We want to try to stick with three meals and two snacks. And as we talked about how grazing works, it's just a very, it doesn't work well for your teeth and your cut. And also, part of grazing also is that kids tend to not eat their full meals when they're grazing through, um, through the day. So, but it also increases risk of caries. Uh, carbohydrates are another thing to, to realize that they turn into a simple sugar over time as well. So crackers, whole wheat bread, white bread, potato chips, pretzels, all of those can turn to sugars over time. Stay away from gummies. Now, those would be your fruit snacks, your fruit roll-ups, your gummy bears, and also even the, the, the gummy vitamins that you can get. Um, those aren't very good for your teeth as well. So what we want to do is just reinforce a good diet at this time because high sugary diet practices established by 12 months of age are maintained throughout early childhood, and in turn I would think it would go on into adulthood, and that is from the AAP. So, Sugar-containing drinks between meals also increases risk of caries. And again, we talked about juice, formula, soda, and this would include your sports drinks. Um, also, what we would talk about is also some of those drinks that the flavored waters um, can have some diluted uh, juice in there. And also, even if they don't have sugar in them, they can be highly acidic, which is not good for their teeth, too. So I do recommend that you look at the back label and take a look and see if they have different types of acids in there, like citric acid, malic acid, anything like that. Then you know that it's a pretty um, acidic drink. So you want to really try to stay away from that. Um, as for juice, again, as the AP recommends, you really shouldn't do more than four to six ounces of juice per day from a cup with a meal or snack for one to six-year-olds. So if your child really loves juice and you just can't give it up, we do recommend that you just have it once a day. At least you can have that and not just try to keep it away from them throughout the day. That's what's key. You just don't want them to just kind of have it there drinking all the time because it really can pool in there and cause a lot of havoc. So as we talked about non-nutritive habits, which is basically thumbs, fingers, pacifier, things like that, and it all comes from the rooting or sucking reflex. Um, and when do we usually tell people to stop? That's a good question because it's really hard for a lot of parents and children to go through this, especially since a lot of kids who do tend to use their thumb are pacifiers. It's to soothe themselves. So pacifiers are a lot easier to take away, but you really can't take away uh, a thumb or a finger, obviously. So we do recommend that you do by age three, but sometimes it's, it's a bit difficult. But if you wait until about 28 months, 24 to 28 months, what we've seen is that child will stop on their own. If, it, if they do it on their own, they'll stop by this age. So that's that's one way you could do it, but the longer you wait, the harder it is to get rid of the pacifier finger. So also another study had shown that 90% of kids will stop at age 48 months also. But the problem with this, again, is the dental effects. So the longer you wait, the greater the dental effects. So what they did notice is that at two years old, you have a dental effect, but then by age four, it can be even worse. So it's really it's a tough situation and it's really difficult and you have to just figure out when the best time is for you and your family. But I, I would um, point out that moms that are nervous about the baby sucking their fingers or sucking their thumbs when they're infants, that's completely normal and it's not something to try to avoid or it's not something to worry about. Uh, I'm making up a number here, but probably 95% of babies will suck at some point, chew, suck, mouth their hands and their fingers, and they'll help themselves fall asleep that way or settle themselves in the car seat that way. And um, the majority of babies do that, and the majority of babies move away from that when they get past that intense oral stage, uh, usually around 12 to 18 months. And then the ones that hold on to it longer, like Dr. Wu was saying, typically will give it up by the time they're two, and if they don't, then perhaps that's the time to intervene. But please don't worry if your five-month-old or nine-month-old is sucking their thumb at night. That's normal, and I think there's got to be a very good reason why the thumb fits so perfectly in the roof of the mouth exactly for that reason. Yes, probably. <laughs> so non nutritive sucking, such as pacifiers. Pacifier, as we talked about, is similar to the bottle. It can increase the risk of, a risk of acute otitis media, which is an ear infection, and that's typically for ages two to five years old. As for pacifier safety, you want to just take, at it, take a look at it daily. Um, no parts should be separating, especially even if it's um, baby's favorite one. You probably just want to make sure it's not separating, it's not safe. Uh, if the child is chewing it instead of sucking on it, then you want to use a teething toy. Um, and as you can see, if you're using a large pacifier like the one that they have on the Wubba, 
um, it should at least have two air vents, and that way you're not worried about the baby not able to breathe. Um, and don't tie it around the child's neck. That's not safe either. Mm -hmm. There's also good research that shows um, that uh, the babies that uh, have a pacifier in a child care, daycare environment do have a, the highest risk of ear infection. And I believe that is because the pacifier serves as a germ magnet. And uh, particularly if the pacifier is clipped to the baby's shirt and the baby is learning to sit and crawl, uh, it gets dragged along the play mat, dragged along the floor, it goes back in the baby's mouth, it's sampled by another baby, and so on. So possibly by the time your baby is starting to be mobile, it may be a good idea to limit pacifier use to the car seat, uh, the crib, and for sleep, rather than having the baby uh, tote it around with them during play. All right, thanks. And this is um, the last, pretty much one of our last slides. We talk about injury prevention. And typically your pediatrician will be going over this with you anyway, but we do try to provide some age-appropriate injury prevention. And, you know, obviously you should really have your car seat facing backwards um, until about age one, but really the new recommendation, I believe, is until age two. So try to keep the, those um, baby seats facing, uh, rear facing for a bit of time. Um, as for childproofing, that would be including baby gates because of the stairs, and you don't want your child to fall and bump your tooth while they're bump their tooth while um, going down the stairs if they roll down on accident or even a head injury or anything like that. As for electrical cord safety, you really want to keep them away from the electrical cords because if they were to gnaw on it or anything like that, they could get an electrical burn and that's just not a good thing to have happen. Um, again, as we talked about pacifier safety in detail before, that's something you really want to take a look at as well. Um, and then here we have the acknowledgments. And uh, a lot of this material you can find on the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry website. Um, and also, my dear friend, uh, Dr. Isabel Chase, definitely helped me out with a lot of the content in this and a few of the studies that she had put in. Um, and she's the director of the Predoctoral Pediatric Dentistry Program at Children's Hospital Boston. And um, I'll hand this off to Nancy, who I think we're going to be answering some questions. We have so many questions, and um, I'm glad that um, you know, we looked at them ahead of time, and we knew that many of the questions that came in we'd be addressing in the presentation. When do we take the baby to the dentist uh, for the first time? When do we start using a toothbrush, toothpaste, uh, and so on? Um, a couple of questions um, I, would, I would like to add is uh, somebody asked today in the presentation, you recommend going to the dentist around the first birthday, but how many teeth should a child have to make it reasonable to go for that first visit? Would you, if a, if a child was 12 months old and ha only had two teeth or four teeth, do you think it's better to wait until 18 months until they go to the dentist? Oh no, we should definitely see them um, by age one because this first year visit is really for education and for anticipatory guidance. We want to go over everything that we think that you're going to see. Um, and also, if there are any issues, we can take a look in there and we can see some people, even though you're supposed to get 20 baby teeth, some of the kids aren't getting 20 baby teeth. Some people are missing teeth and they may actually or have extra teeth. So even if your child doesn't have any teeth, at least we can take a look and see if everything is you know, progressing the way they should be or normally. And also because the education portion is just so important. That's what really the first year visit is about, is mostly education. And we want to make sure that you know how to lay down a great foundation and, and um, to start preventing cavities from forming. Mm -hmm. Now the first teeth that come in are typically the two bottom teeth followed by the two top teeth. And, and um, these are called the incisors? Yes, so the central incisors come in first. And then usually those are the bottom ones that first come in. And then afterwards, usually the upper ones and then the lateral incisors. Yeah. Now these are, these are um, what I call the biting teeth because these are the teeth that you would use if you were going to bite into an apple or bite a carrot. Um, the molars don't come in until significantly later, sometime between one and a half and two and a half years old, and those are the chewing teeth. So remember that your babies and, and toddlers can chew soft foods very, very well without having those chewing teeth. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because of a question that came in. Uh, these, these incisors, their bottom two and the top two teeth, they are very, very sharp when they cut through. They're almost like an, a, a razor edge. Um, and once they've been through for a, a few weeks, they do tend to dull down a little bit. Um, and um, there's a very annoying habit that many babies have of grinding the top teeth and the bottom teeth together. And even though that can raise 
uh, goosebumps up and down your back when you listen to your baby do that in the car, it does in some ways begin to dull down uh, the sharpness of the teeth. And that's where those hard, firm teethers can come in handy. But this mom wants to know about the jagged edges of her baby's teeth. She says that her 12-month-old has two and a half teeth, um, but the edges are all jagged. And uh, is that normal? Yeah, it can be normal. We typically see more of that with permanent teeth, but on baby teeth we do see that too sometimes. They're called mammalons, and mammalons are basically little bumps on the surface, on the very edge um, at the tip of the, of the tooth. And what it does is it just helps the tooth come right in or cut right in through the gums. Um, and it will be normal. And just like what Nancy said, if they're grinding away at the teeth, they're going to just grind off the mammalons, which is perfectly fine. Yeah, the, many babies do go through a phase of grinding the top and bottom teeth, and this is not going to be a long-term issue of your baby grinding and having TMJ and so on. This is usually a temporary stage, and I, I think a lot of it has to do with developmentally, the baby trying to figure out, what the heck are these new things in my mouth, and if I press them together, I make the sound and sensation. And that might be your cue to hand them a teething toy, which they may or may not decide to gnaw on. Um, it is a little bit of a, of a creepy phase, but it does pass. Um, I'm going to combine several questions together for this. Um, one mom asks, how soon after the teething symptoms start should the teeth cut? And then another mom asks, how long does it take for a tooth to erupt from when you begin to feel the tooth through the gums? So um, again, uh, at the beginning of the presentation, I talked a little bit about the difference between teething behaviors and cutting a tooth. You will see the baby's hands in the mouth, an increase in saliva production, chewing and gnawing, starting around three to four months. By five and six months, this is going to be a constant behavior, and there will be streams of drool flowing down your baby's shirt front. Um, and none of those things are a sign that a tooth is imminent. Those are classic, normal baby behaviors. Also, remember from what Dr. Wu was saying, your baby has, theoretically, 20 teeth in there. And believe it or not, like a shark, they actually have the second, the second layer of teeth in there, too. So there's really two rows of, of teeth in the jaw. Yeah. They're all under there, and you may be able to see faintly the shadows of those primary teeth, and you certainly may be able to feel them, uh, some of them, underneath there. But neither of those are signs that the tooth is coming through uh, right away. When you see um, first a swelling and then a slit uh, in the gum line, especially for these incisors that come out very sharp, uh, that's where you'll know that there's a tooth coming. Sometimes parents will say, oh, I'm sure my baby's getting a tooth because I see a, a, a big white um, dot way back there, look way back there. And then I have to break the news that that's actually not a tooth at all. It's a very normal uh, cyst. And I'll, I'll include uh, a post uh, that, that we put up on our blog a couple days ago that talked about these Epstein pearls mm -hmm. um, and um, Bond's nodules. Yeah, yeah, Bond's nodules. And um, they're not teeth. So pretty much you're going to see the, the two bottom teeth followed by the two top teeth. That's pretty classic. Look for a slit. When you see the slit, put your finger in the slit, press down. If you feel something that feels like the edge of a fingernail, that's the tooth. If a sleep disruption or fussiness is going on night after night after night, six, seven, eight, ten, twelve days in a row, and you haven't seen a tooth, it's not a tooth. Um, I have a sneaky suspicion that when babies are very young and fussy, people call it colic or gas. And when babies are a little bit older and fussy, people call it teething. And it's just that being a baby is hard and babies are irritable for a variety of reasons. Okay, here's a great question. Um, a mom wants to know why aren't sealants applied to primary teeth? And can you actually explain what a sealant is? Yeah, and sure. Now, a sealant is basically a little covering that we paint onto your tooth and we cure it. And it basically helps seal off the glues. Like, say, I usually tell people it's kind of like cauliflower, groovy. That's how your baby teeth kind of look. And if you flow a little liquid over there, a little uh, plastic coating, what it does is it seals off those grooves, kind of like how on a uh, driveway you're sealing off the cracks. What it does is it makes it so that it's harder for plaque and food to get into the area of the teeth and it helps prevent cavities. So that's what a sealant is. And in fact, in some cases, we actually will put a sealant on a baby molar um, just because we find that they may be more prone to getting cavities or we see, start to see more staining or whatnot, then we know that there needs to be help, especially because those baby molars can be in there. They usually erupt, what is it, we said around two to three, and a lot of times some of those won't fall out until even age 12 to 13. So they are important teeth, and we want to keep them in there nice and safe and clean, and um, that way the child can eat, talk, and um, hold space for new teeth that will come in later on. Mm -hmm. okay. um, 
Let's see, I'm curious your opinion. A mom wants to know, is Tylenol or um, Advil or Motrin better for teething? So Tylenol is ibuprofen um, and uh, Advil or Motrin, uh, sorry, Tylenol, Tylenol is acetaminophen, is acetaminophen yeah. and um, Advil or Motrin is ibuprofen. Okay. Ibuprofen has an anti-inflammatory effect. It's also a little bit longer lasting. So for a baby over six months, that's my preference. Um, to give. If, if your right. baby is very irritable, they're just having a rough day, you're at your wit's end, you're not sure why they're uncomfortable, if it's teething, if it's something else going on, it's okay, as long as your pediatrician agrees, it's okay to give a single dose of either one of these analgesics to see if it makes them a little bit more comfortable. But what's not okay is to give your baby Tylenol or ibuprofen every day or around the clock or at bedtime every night to manage so-called teething pain. Right. And I agree. I agree that ibuprofen, which is the Advil or Motrin, tends to work a bit better just because of the um, non steroidal anti-inflammatory um, effect of it. So it is good to use. And Tylenol is good too, but it's just not as effective. And it is shorter acting, so you have to deal with, you know, waking up again in the middle of the night with them. So uh, with the Advil, kind of lasts a little longer. So that's good. Yeah. Um, here's a couple of, of uh, interesting questions. I get this one a lot about the, um, the Highlands teething tablets, um, the homeopathic teething remedies. And um, it's possible that these work. And the reason they work is if you read the ingredients, there's um, such a minute homeopathic ingredient in there um, that it's questionable whether or not that really can do anything, although that's the whole philosophy of, of homeopathy, and I won't address that right now. But the key thing with the Highland heating tablets is that it is in a lactose uh, base, and that means that it's, uh, it's in a milk sugar base, and so it's slightly sweet. And if you put two or three grains of sugar on your baby's tongue, your baby would respond um, be ha a little bit happier and a little bit calmer for a few minutes. And that's why, in my opinion, the Highland teething tablets work. So somebody asked about, um, is, you know, is it, do I have to put that in the baby's mouth or can I put that in the baby's milk? Um, and um, frankly, I think it works. It's not so much a placebo effect. It works because you're putting a tiny little drop of sweetener on the baby's tongue. That's the primary and only reason why, uh, in my opinion, those work. Another question is about the amber teething necklaces. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd love to see some more research on this. Um, it, there is a, a theory that amber, true amber, Baltic amber, placed against the human skin, warmed, releases an anti-inflammatory uh, effect. And that actually has been studied and, um, and may well be true. Now, amber teething necklaces, can seem a little concerning because we really don't want to put something around a baby's neck, do we? Yeah. Uh, but um, if you choose to use something like this, I think then just focusing on safety, making sure that it's, it's not tight around the baby's neck, but it's snug enough so that they can't put their fingers or get caught on something. So it should not be a dangling necklace. And then much like um, a high-quality uh, pearl necklace, each bead should be individually knotted so that um, if it does get, get caught or removed, the beads don't scatter and uh, allow the baby to eat them. Also, all of these types of teething necklaces should have a quick release um, uh, impact so that if it does get caught on something and pulled, the child would never be at risk of um, being caught or strangled, that it would, it would open at that spot. So I really can't say uh, if it does or doesn't help. I would just focus on the, the safety aspects. Um, I see that it is uh, toward the end of our time. A lot of questions came in, um, but um, I will uh, send out an email tomorrow with a link to this recording and also some links to a variety of articles um, on teething, teethers. Um, we have one on the, the pregnancy gingivitis and the risk between prenatal um, uh, oral care and uh, preeclampsia and uh, premature birth and so on. So I'll, I'll send you all of that information and the link to the breastfeeding and biting webinar and so on. Um, I really want to thank you, Dr. Wu, for coming in today and um, taking our questions and sharing information. And um, I will also include your contact information in your practice for anyone that's looking for a pediatric dentist here in the greater Boston area. Well, thank you, Nancy. This has been great. And uh, we really appreciate uh, you having me here. So thanks right. again. Thanks, everybody.